Welcome back to another episode of Control Alt Career. I'm your host, Jennifer Ong, and in this podcast, I interview people who have taken a leap of faith and pursued an alternative career path in Asia. Today, I'm super happy to have Alex and Clara join us. Alex and Clara are the married couple and co founders behind the direct to consumer bedsheets brand Sunday Bedding, based here in Singapore. So before we get into the podcast, I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of background about who Alex and Clara is. Alex grew up only knowing about good quality bed sheets. His family has actually been in the textile manufacturing industry for over three decades. Clara, on the other hand, actually had no intention of ever starting a business until she met Alex at Columbia Business School. She had previously worked in consulting, finance, and tech. She actually just started out brainstorming ideas with Alex and helping him out here and there. But over time, she got more and more involved with Sunday bedding and actually just last year quit her full-time job as a data analyst and joined Sunday bedding full-time. All right, I'll hand it over to them now to tell their full story. And so for me, I've ever since college graduation, I've been working at my family business, which is in home textiles manufacturing, not something you graduate thinking you would want to work in. We do a lot of the white label OEM type to American clients. I think about 90 to 95% of our clients are American. And over the years, my role sort of went from dealing with the B2B side, and then I worked a bit on our consumer brand in Hong Kong. My career path is quite set in the sense that I am looking to grow my family business in one shape or another. And I think for me, after business school, I did think about perhaps a more updated version of a consumer brand that's fitting to the digital climate, to the economy now. I sort of wanted to test out a bit with all the direct-to-consumer uh, trends that we see. I think I got started in it, spent about half a year to a year playing around with the idea, but it just never, I just don't feel comfortable enough with the sort of angle that we had going at that time. It didn't feel like it was something different from what all the other competitors had in the market. So at the time I shelved the idea until a few years down the line, then Clara and I actually are moving in and we brought the idea up again. And yeah. I think for me, I didn't really plan on starting a business. I think I only really started thinking about it when I moved back to Singapore. When I kind of like reflect what I wanted out of my job or career, I wanted something like consumer facing. I wanted a role where I'm actually doing a bit of everything. There just wasn't that many opportunities around that fit what I wanted. And so when Alex moved to Singapore, we just started chatting about this. And was that a deliberate decision to ask Clara to join the company? I think I just got more and more involved. Like at the start, I was just <laughs> like, just oh, kept okay, roping her I'll, in. Like, I'll help you. And then, you know, I gave him the context of like the, the marketing and PR agencies. And then I just got more and more involved. So it just came to the point where like, I might as well do this part time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me backtrack a yeah. little bit. Um, so Alex, I guess for you, did you have a choice to not go into the family business? Yes and no. I mean, as the years goes by, is the way I perceive the family business is just evolved. It, perhaps at first it was quite a reluctance, but now it's just a platform that you have to work on and you see it as a career, right? You have baggages from the last generation, but you also have immensely resourceful platform that you can work on to build whatever it is that you want to build and make changes that you see fit. Okay, so you've kind of come to terms with working for the family and I think you guys have been able to build something super exciting on the back of the existing infrastructure that you guys have on the family business. Was that, I guess, how did the idea come about? For my family business, it's always been strictly OEM. We've evolved over the years what uh, products or what uh, services we provide to our clients, but it's always been in a B2B setting. We've always been dealing with more, whether it's mass market or a luxury brand, but we've been always white labeling for other people. So 
in a sense, I feel that the family business is very strong in a certain field or in a certain segment in the uh, supply chain of the home textiles. But for where we are going next, I feel that for me to build a brand is also beneficial to the family business itself in terms of having the supply chain be more flexible, so to speak, or having an insight in where the design trend is going towards. There's a lot of things that Sunday bedding can feed back to, but for all intents and purposes, as we grow, there's less dependence from the support that the family business can offer so in terms of the manufacturing or in terms of lead time. Because as you scale, you start looking for different sourcing alternatives. I think the way I pitched it at first, the idea was that we would be in a very unique position to actually start a new brand, one that is more direct to consumer, one that is more digital native, one that has updated aesthetics towards a millennial market and a market that we have not explored. On top of the direct-to-consumer branding side of things, I also discussed this as a very low amount of investment on our end in terms of we have to do the branding, we have to do the production side of it. But other than that, it's not anything that our manufacturing doesn't have the capability of. We've already have, uh, we already have the infrastructure. We need to put in more effort in terms of marketing, in terms of launching the brand itself. My family were quite open to it. It was something that was interesting. That was not something that they have dwelled into before. Yeah, so I guess then my question is, how did you guys decide to launch in Singapore? So Noclara, you're from Singapore. Alex, you're from Hong Kong. Your manufacturing facilities are in China. Why, why was Singapore the right market to launch in? I think on one hand, we're both physically here. Clara has a much better and deeper understanding of the shopping behavior of a Singaporean. And we see it as quite a good market generally. People are very willing to spend. There's a affinity to support a local brand. They are picky consumers in the sense that they know good quality. They know what is good bang for the buck. They are discerning. Yeah, I think for e-commerce in Asia, I would say Singapore is pretty developed. Everyone has, I'm pretty sure everyone in Singapore has bought something online. So I think that makes it an easier starting ground. We've, we actually tried to launch in Hong Kong. It was a year after we launched in Singapore, but what we found was that in Hong Kong, the e-commerce shopping behavior is quite different. I think Singapore is a more homogeneous market. So in a way, it makes things a bit easier to test. Whereas in Hong Kong, for instance, what we found out was that even though you know the population is about the same size as Singapore and also quite developed, income levels are about the same. We found that there's like different pockets of people, like the expats and then the local kind of Hong Kong residents, and it's quite different in terms of the behavior and even things like language, like localizing it. Um, in Singapore, using English is like totally fine, and everyone kind of understands that, but. In Hong Kong, for instance, I think the local Hong Kong residents do appreciate some like Cantonese copies inside your website or your marketing material. I think at least when I first started out, I thought, oh, it could be like, you know, an Asian brand, right? But then, you know, as we kind of moved along along these two years, we've, we've found that our brand seems to resonate a bit better with the Western audiences. So we actually get a lot of traffic from North America, so US and Canada. Whereas when we look at the regional market, so let's say like Malaysia or like Indonesia, we do get some traffic there, but we've found that it's much harder to convert just based on what we've done. The, the ultimate goal is to definitely expand beyond Singapore, but I think the question that we are also struggling right now is, you know, which market do we go into? And at the moment, we are leaning more towards North America. Yeah. Makes sense. I guess I wanted to backtrack a bit. So when you guys first started the company, how did you decide what product to start with? Alex was working quite closely with the <clears throat> merchandising manager at the factory. So what she did was to give us a few samples 
and we literally just went to our friends and was like oh touch and feel this like which ones do, do you like and that's like how we shortlisted so that's how the bamboo satin um, material and product came about because everyone touched it and was like oh we really like this so we launched with bamboo and cotton cotton only because it was it's, oh, it's just yeah, such a it, staple that we should definitely do it at launch because you can yeah. never go wrong right it's a safety sort of piece yeah bamboo is a is a novelty at the time and i think that it was resonating very well with our friends and people that we asked and then i think in terms of colors so we launched with a very limited range it was just three colors white which is a classic gray and then we also wanted a design because we found a lot of people like buying designs the first one we just looked for a freelance designer to come up with a couple of ideas and we really just picked one out of five to seven designs that he did and it was very very successful i think for us as a launch product as well because it was something different from the rest of the market most of the direct-to-consumer brands or even for uh, bigger brands they tend to do solid colors because it was the safer choice right with designs it's always quite a gamble you're not sure whether this design would resonate with the audience that you're presenting it to yeah. i think yeah. when we started to be honest we, we didn't really know what we were doing <laughs> just kind of like oh you know let's do like a design and then like these two colors and then the design called drizzling rain turned out quite well so i think after that we were more intentional with the way we approach the colors and design but i would say at first it was kind of like Oh, let's, 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 let's throw it out and see what sticks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got, it. Got it. Okay. And was there any sort of like, like minimum viable product that you guys came up with? Or it was just like, okay, we've decided we're going to launch. We have three products. Um, go. Or did you do some sort of like Facebook testing beforehand to kind of like see I, I if that. people would resonate? I know that there are... I know that people there are some advices where they would say start a fake instagram page or a fake facebook shop <laughs> where you start selling you see whether this works and if there's a lot of people that place these orders then you can properly launch it but to me i think that is not the way we would prefer to do things uh mvp so to speak for us was really like we just launched with it I guess from a manufacturing point of view, it was not a huge investment, but it's not an insignificant amount of money that we had to set aside to. In terms of the launch event itself, that was also a sizable investment. This might not be what we would have in mind when we're talking about launching a startup. A lot of times people are talking about starting with a minimum viable product and then pivoting when you get different feedback. I think also with an actual physical product, it's quite difficult to go down the route of like, oh, let's kind of have an MVP and then see how it goes. Because there's things like minimum order quantity that's also like lead time. So it's quite difficult. I wouldn't call us like a typical tech startup because at the end of the day, we are selling bed sheets, right? There's nothing very... Yeah, innovative and... about it if you think about it so a lot of the things that we we did and and are still doing i would say it's actually quite like a traditional retail brand i think the only difference is that we do it in a way that's more digitally native from a consumer point of view so we do like facebook and instagram ads we have a lot of like online content but in terms of like the back end it's quite similar to a lot of traditional retail. I think for for us as well, being in home textiles and as a lifestyle brand, I suppose. Well, we first started off be it doing bed linens and doing textiles, right? It's such a tactile experience that it's irreplaceable. You can't really develop an MVP for it unless you get people to touch it. And all our content creation, our digital ads, our website, consumer facing, any materials that we have for the consumers are still towards serving the goal of having them be able to sort of 
understand what sort of tactile experience, what sort of lifestyle experience that we're trying to deliver here too. Mm -hmm. For us, I think it's very different. There's no MVP in terms of making you feel rested, right? We can't really give you a short taste of that and then say that, hey, if you buy more from <laughs> us, we can deliver more rest to you. That's, that's not how it works, right? But I guess, did you guys ever need to test whether or not Singaporeans would be open to purchasing bedsheets online? I don't think we ever did a test. Okay. I think it was more like, I'm the target audience and I will buy it. Yeah, <laughs> and I think there yeah. are other indicators, right? Yeah. The sort of economy or the sort of environment that direct-to-consumer brands cropped out of in the States came from the fact that there's a lot of big box retailers that are charging a huge markup simply because they have to pay for rent, they have to pay for designer fees. Whereas with Warby Barker coming up, it was to tackle the monopoly that Luxottica had over sunglasses or eyewear. And for Brooklyn and for Casper, they are all ta tackling similar issues that we were seeing at the time when we launched is that when we asked our friends where they go to buy beddings, do they remember when the last time they bought beddings? It's the same exact answer that I would expect you to have when you ask people back in 2013, right? You would walk into a department store, you would just let the salesperson point to you what you should be getting with beddings, then they would just be, hey, does this feel good, right? That's the only indicator you would have going forward buying the, these kind of products. Whereas for us, I think that was a sort of indicator that, hey, for us launching a digital native brand in Singapore, there would be a certain market that are tired of buying from department stores, of not understanding what sort of products they're getting, of having no stories behind why they buy from this brand. So yeah. I think that was that was confidence inducing enough for us to say that. But I think I think to your point, so right now when we are deciding which other market to launch in, what we've done is to run uh, Facebook ads to test. So we essentially set aside a pretty small budget to do remarketing in Malaysia, Canada, North America, Hong Kong, and Australia, because these were like the top five traffic sources. And that's, that's when we found out that in the US, we got the most add to carts and even a couple of conversions. So that's how we came to the conclusion of like, hey, maybe um, the US is the next place to, to go to. Okay. So it sounds like, okay, you guys were like pretty confident that like this was the business that you guys wanted to start. Um, and then you guys launched. Okay, so after it launched, how did it go? The way we launched, we basically um, collaborated with an influencer who's quite big in the home and lifestyle space. So she has this shop house in Tiong Bahru. We moved in like bits and our bed sheets and we invited media and also the public to come. It was more than what we expected. We were very happy with how the launch event went. It definitely got the eyeballs and the ears of our target audience. We got people to start talking about us. So after the launch, you still have to put in the hours and the work to make sure your brand is out there. So for the first year, we did a lot of like pop-ups, like even really small ones at fairs. It's very tiring, but I think every brand kind of needs to go through that, in Singapore at least. The feedback that we got from attending all these pop-ups are that first we have a design which caught people's eyes. There's something that digital marketing cannot replace. With pop-ups, with people that would stop and actually have a conversation with you, with them understanding a bit more about your brand, with them also telling you what their issue has been. I think that was what arguably drove a lot of our improvement, a lot of our product developments and yeah. So I guess if someone were to start a direct-to-consumer brand today, is that the biggest piece of advice you would give them? Like, you know, it was it's really tiring doing these pop-ups, but actually it's crucial to go out there and, and talk to customers instead of just like hiding behind your screen and doing online ads? Yeah, I mean, no. I would say so, especially if it's a physical product. I think it's always useful to meet your customers. 
Um, and I think especially in markets in Asia, I think people still appreciate kind of like shopping in store and like talking to someone. And when you're new, people don't know the quality of your product. So there's no better way to physically show it to them. And having that human face for the customers to talk to makes it a little more intimate for them as well. The organic word of mouth growth that we got from having these small pop-ups, having these conversations, having loyal customers really helped us in the early phases of our business. I mean, arguably, it's still helping us a lot now. This idea of having a direct-to-consumer, a digital native brand selling bedsheets online is still a very, very novel idea at the time. Hopefully, we will have converted some people to say, hey, let's go look these people up first. And then maybe if we like them, then we can buy from them. We can still go to the physical stores, but it's a question of priority, right? Mm -hmm. So perhaps it would work for a new brand in this climate to focus more on the digital side of things. But I think there's something invaluable about it. But I think it's precisely because there are more brands, more online brands popping up these days that the physical is where you can differentiate. Oh, that's fair. Because like, ultimately, um, if everyone is just going to spend money on Facebook and Instagram, that's not very helpful. So I, I see it as a differentiating point. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah I think it's very interesting because a lot of companies now are starting to realize actually having a physical store is really important mm. too. Um, and sometimes actually acquiring a customer using the physical foot traffic is cheaper than yeah. the money you spend on <laughs> Facebook ads. <laughs> <laughs> and also thinking through the, the whole experience between like online and offline, like the whole like omni-channel experience. And especially for millennials, it's like talking to the founders and hearing the story. And then you see them at the store and you're like, wow, okay, like these people are like so committed to this. Like I want to support them too. Um, it makes you guys feel more real as well, as opposed to like, oh, like it's just like another big corporation and like, yeah, they're just trying to push me bed sheets yeah. and I have no idea who they are. Yeah, <laughs> Um, so maybe shifting gears a little bit, the bedding business is something that is quite commoditized. And also people don't really need to buy new sheets that often. I guess, how have you guys, mm, I guess, worked around those constraints? Yeah, I mean, firstly, around the second point about people not buying bed sheets too often. I think that's what we thought at first. But then what we found out is that when people first buy our product, they like it so much and then they buy it as gifts. So they buy it as like housewarming gifts or like for their parents. And I think Alex kind of um, mentioned it earlier is that we're trying to uh, pivot towards being more of a lifestyle brand. I know that word is being overused these days, but I think the idea is that we want to help our customers rest better. And rest could mean different things. Obviously, sleep and bedding is a very big part of it. And I think also what we've found, especially this year with kind of COVID, everyone working from home, is that the boundaries between rest and, and work, it's increasingly being blurred. And so we want to give like moments of rest to our customers throughout the day. And, and that's why we are also expanding into different categories to facilitate that. So we launched bath towels two months ago because we found that, you know, the, the whole shower and bath routine is actually quite a big part of winding down for a lot of people. And then also a month ago, we collaborated with a local sustainable fashion brand to do loungewear just because it's something that you can wear throughout the day as you're working from home. And I guess when you guys were first starting out, did you guys set aside like a certain budget for you to launch this company? Before you launch a brand, if you do your research, you go talk to the suppliers, you go find a reliable one to deliver the products that you think would work, especially in this day and age where people care about the sustainability part of it, then it becomes even <laughs> more effort on your end. But let's move beyond that. Let's say, okay, you found somebody you like, the cost of goods sold, the cost of building a website, building a whole brand. Uh, assuming that you can also do the branding and the website design, given how easy it is with Shopify and Square, you have the whole online payment with PayPal and everything. Then I think the biggest 
cost really issues with marketing, right? And I think with marketing, you have to know or at least tell yourself how fast you want to grow. So let's say like after paying all that, you you don't have a lot of money left because of like budget or you don't have investors or like whatever it is. Then you just have to kind of go like go the slower way, you know, doing a lot of pop ups, organic. Uh, word of mouth, which of course it's slower than you throwing a whole lot of money into digital marketing or like engaging a PR agency, for instance, because it's definitely going to be more costly. So I would say, just kind of figure out how much you have after all the fixed costs, um, like paying your suppliers, setting up a website, you know, renting a, a warehouse or a storage unit, and then see how much you're comfortable to spend. But also set your expectations, because obviously the lower the budget, then the slower the growth is. Yeah, and having organic like word of mouth, having happy customers is still perhaps the biggest growth factor for early on, and doing that costs very very little money. It's just a lot and a lot of effort. You have to show in, show up every weekend or like every few weekends to be able to sit at a place and. Really have to sell your products, sell your brand, and I think, yeah, you could do that with very little cost, right? Yeah. Did you guys ever consider getting investors on board? We are toying with the idea. I think, especially since we aspire to be more than a brand that caters to the Singapore market, if we have to grow abroad, whichever market it may be. Will definitely need support, not from a, not only from a monetary point of view, but also we have to get advisors, people who could guide us in terms of where we can scale. We're still relatively young; we're two years old. I made a lot of mistakes, and I think there's a lot of value in terms of having mentors, having people with. Scale startup scaling expertise, being able to tell you, hey, you should watch out for this pitfall, or even just from an HR point of view, right? Like, if we are to build a team in US or in Canada, where we are localizing our brand, I mean, we w- we could have a million elements in our brand currently where it speaks to the North American consumers, but we still need a team locally to do. Ninety percent of the work in the back end is supply chain. It's customer service. Is um, being able to create and craft content that is more suited for North America, right? I think there's a lot of work there, and having reliable people as investors would speed up that process and help us make le- less mistakes as we grow. Yeah. And you feel like at this point in the company's journey is the point where it makes sense to get VCs and investors on board, because at the early stages you you still feel like okay uh, when we're launching in Singapore you guys felt like you had a good handle on this, um, that you didn't really need investors to come in to advise you on that too much. <laughs> more like at the time it's not worth it for us to get any investors. Um, I think early on we we could afford to make mistakes because. We're small. We are agile enough to recover from it, to be able to cover for our mistakes. But when you're at the scale where you're a hundred times bigger than you were before, right? Then every mistake that you made before, when it's at a magnitude of like a hundred other people, right? Then it becomes overwhelming. We're at the point where we can say that we understand how we want to present our brand perfectly. But we have a good enough grasp that we know what we want to do and what we don't want to do. So, this is where it would make sense for us to get support. Yeah. Yeah, I think also right now we are growing quite a bit, even in Singapore. And I think whether we get investors or not, I think it's definitely very helpful to get a group of advisors or mentors. Even things like you know non-branding things like. You know, in our warehouse, we now have, you know, way more than a hundred SKUs, right? And it's getting a bit out of hand in terms of the way we manage things. And the first year is fine, right? Because you you don't have that many customers, you don't have that many like SKUs, and so I kind of see this being a pain point 
going forward. So this is just one example of where someone could be like, hey, you know, maybe you want to consider this, or we could learn from the experiences of other startups or other brands, like how do they scale um, properly? You know, what kind of processes do they put in place? Yeah, it's just advice like this would be really helpful, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to also ask you guys about COVID. Um, I know that during COVID, a lot of businesses have suffered, but it seems like your kind of business should be one of those who actually benefited from the stay at home and people buying more things for their homes. So kind of wanted to hear how that has affected your business. Yeah, so we are quite lucky. So we weren't negatively impacted during COVID. We were a bit worried when the circuit breaker was first announced because we weren't quite sure like what was essential, like bed sheets are not. I guess it's not like an essential item, but thank goodness, you know, e-commerce businesses were allowed to operate. And so during that three months, I think we almost doubled or more. Yeah, more, yeah more I think than we, we more than doubled our volume. So that was good. But I think after that, we kind of ran out of stock because we just didn't expect such an increase in demand. So basically, since July until now, we're just trying to catch up in terms of restocking. So in terms of overall sales, it's definitely helped a lot. And I think also because we had we doubled our volumes during that three months, the word of mouth increased as well. So even though with phase three and phase two, people started going back out a lot more, our sales dropped. But it's the sales levels are definitely still higher than before circuit breaker. So, so we are quite thankful for, for that, yeah. That's great. And do you feel like because you guys have such a strong manufacturing background that that really helps you with your brand and like kind of helps differentiate you from like other I competitors? Think on, definitely. Um, I think in terms of the material, yes, because I think the advantage is that we can work with a merchandising manager from the factory So she can kind of recommend like, oh, this would be good for Singapore's weather or something like that. So I think that's one advantage. But in terms of like production planning, like lead time and things like minimum order quantity, we are still subject to the same constraints. It's the same market constraint that we have. So I would say it's more of the merchandising that we have an advantage. Yeah, and I think it's definitely, you have an ease of comfort knowing that this supplier won't suddenly just not reply your email. Having the breadth and the depth of knowledge in terms of the many different products that we can offer, it definitely helps a lot knowing what the standard best practice is and how could we improve on that as well. That is something invaluable, I think. Yeah. And I feel like consumers nowadays are also increasingly want to know about how things are being produced. So you guys having that expertise, I think, can really help as well. Yeah, it, we, we actually put in quite a lot of effort into thinking about why we chose this material. Why is it the way it is? But it's not something that's translatable, but it definitely helps in edging our customers to think that, oh, this is actually a very worthwhile product to have, you know. And all of these small details adds up. So, yeah. Um, and I guess both of you are, so I know Clara, you are still working at your analytics role at a pharmaceutical company. And Alex, are you also still helping with your family with like the OEM side as well? Not as much, oh, but so I'm sitting into meetings, but not. Okay. I'm not actively working on anything. Okay, so this for you is like, the majority of your time. Yeah, and Clara will be joining at the end of the year, which is oh, yeah. 10 days. Yeah. So, oh, so, so you, you quit? Um, yeah, so I actually, I've been on a part-time contract for the last year, then my contract ends this year. So I figured, you know, it's a good time to transition, yeah. Was that a tough decision for you? For me, it wasn't that tough because the way I kind of approach it even before I started kind of part-time was that I set milestones for myself. So I told myself like, okay, when Sunday bidding reaches X dollars in in monthly revenue, then I'll start considering like going part-time. So I think it's helpful to have this in place because otherwise you just end up in a situation where like 
oh, it's like a side hustle, and then you know you're just like mentally thinking about a lot of things and like, oh, should I quit? And you know, it's just tiring. So I think it's really helpful to have to set these like metrics for yourself. I think it's really smart because then it's like. You take the emotions yeah, out of the decision yeah. a little bit. It's like, okay, these are hard numbers. Yeah. The business has gone to this size, yeah. and I feel comfortable living yeah. um, and, and working full time for this. Yeah. Um, so maybe just like one question for you guys. You know, in the Western world, there's really this concept around like following your passion and your dreams, and eventually the money will come. Whereas in Asia, it's much more around like the concept of financial security, and you know, a job is just supposed to be a job. It's not necessarily supposed to be something that's fun. Kind of wanted to hear what you guys think about this. Like, are you in the camp where it's more follow your dreams and you know the money eventually will come, or the financial security piece is very crucial? I'm very conservative. I don't think I'm the kind of person that's like, oh, you know, this is my passion, and then I'm going to jump all in into it. I'm sure there are people like that, and it works out well for them. But part of the reason, like, why it Took me so long, and I had to go through kind of like different roles and jobs before even considering、um, starting my own business. Is that firstly I needed the confidence that I could do it, and it took me some time to get there. And then secondly, the kind of financial security piece. I feel like at this stage, like even if Sunday bedding collapses completely, I, th- I think I'll be okay. I mean, obviously, I could be in a better financial position, but I'm at a stage of life where it like it'll be fine. So, w- when you speak about that, you feel like now you you feel more confident. Is it because you've saved up enough from your years of working? And did you have like a number in mind, kind of like the way that you when you approach the decision to join Sunday Bedding part time and then full time? Did you also have a dollar amount? In mind that you were like, okay, I'm comfortable. Once I've saved up a nest egg of this size, then、uh, actually not so much. I think part of that confidence was also from the fact that so I went to two years of business school where like I basically had no income and I depleted all my savings、um, to go to business school. And then so at the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, if I can, I mean, I'm still fine, right? I'm still alive, and like <laughs> nothing bad has happened. Then, like, of course, I should be able to do this with like some savings. So, so I think that's my mindset. Alex, so like the same question for you. What are your your thoughts around the financial security and and passion? I mean, <laughs> I'm very lucky and privileged to be born into a family that's relatively okay. We're more than sufficient to provide for ourselves. I do see myself being part of the family business, but how? I interact with it, what I do with this, and how I want to grow is up on this canvas that I can paint on. I think if you look at it from a skill set point of view, then it's more like I'm leveraging up on this platform where there's very strong supply side knowledge, very strong manufacturing expertise. How can I leverage this to at least become a chip on the table for me to be able to? Scale and grow、uh, consumer-facing business. Learning more about what building a consumer-facing business really means is more like okay. I am now stepping out into doing something that I don't think I've really ever done. What can I leverage upon my past previous experience that I could translate into a new environment that is tangentially related? It's also a, a very Demanding growth path for me because it's it's something that I'm comfortable with learning. It's just something that I just have to leave it in the hands of others. And actually, I also wanted to ask you guys. So you guys are married now. Congratulations. <laughs> how how is it working with each other as a married couple? I've mostly been in corporates, right? Like most of my career, so I'm used to doing things in a certain way. In a more professional way, <laughs> <laughs> whereas think- I'm more ad hoc. I think it's more just I'm in a position where I'm just okay. Give me the feedback on this, then I can make my decision based on this input. It's just very different because coming from an Asian SME mindset, it's just its own beast, right? It's just the way certain things has been done. 
I definitely picked up bad habits from that, and I'm still trying to be mindful of that. But yeah, it's not a very easy working experience to really work out the kinks. It also ties back to us having a group of advisors, because I think as a couple, sometimes when you have disagreements, I think the tendency is to not listen to the other person's point of view. Just because you see each other like every day. I, I found that as we grew, so we hired two more people on the team. That actually also helps because you have a group of people to like discuss things, right? From a personal point of view, we've already very well understood how the other person is like, where they're coming from, why they think the way they are. Professionally, it's just taking that one step forward. We consume more or less the same media or the same information. We're dangerously close to being in an echo chamber. And because our line of reasoning is rubbing off of each other, we tend to think in more or less similar ways. We could very well be missing out on viewpoints that we don't really encounter before. Having the new colleagues helped immensely. We are filling in the blanks of the capabilities that we both are lacking. And moving forward, we just need to be able to have more of these different viewpoints to really encourage us to grow as well. Um, and just to close off um, the interview, any uh, advice for people that are thinking about starting like a direct-to-consumer brand? or just things that you wish you knew before you guys uh, embarked on this journey? I think one advice I would give to people starting their own business is, and it's something I'm still trying to learn, is to not take things too personally. I think when you're a brand owner and you take a lot of ownership, right, over the product or the service that you're offering, and inevitably as you're growing, you're going to have negative feedback or like customers that are not happy because you know something happened and I think at the start it's very normal to take take these things very personally but I'm starting to try to kind of separate that because you you cannot please everyone I'm always saying hey look just let's look at what went wrong and then let's just make sure that doesn't happen the next time but that's not to say that it's not emotionally draining, right? Every time you receive some of these emails, a small piece of your soul dies with it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it's not to say that uh, it should affect you, right? Like, I think my conscience is clear as long as we have done the best we can do. And yeah, that's, that's all that we can ask for. And I think the other thing is that when you run your own business, you get flexible hours. But I think it's more like the mental burden doesn't leave you. Like even if you're not working. And I think mentally, you just need to be able to manage that. Yeah. Again, like coming from a family business background, it's just background noise to me. <laughs> family brings the business back oh, yeah, home, yeah. which I don't think is healthy. So I personally have grown up with a mental filter, so to speak. But I think that for me, I need to consciously put aside time to learn new things. There's a lot of things that I am beginning to know that I don't know, right? And to be able to close that gap between where we are at now, it requires me to actually consciously set aside time to be like, hey, this is something I should be learning this week, this today, this week, this month. And I think it's only after starting Sunday betting that I'm start to learn that, hey, these are gaps in my knowledge base that I should fill up as soon as possible. That's very interesting. Keeps you on your toes and makes it makes the job exciting as well. And anxious. <laughs> and, and anxious. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for your time today and, you know, for sharing your very interesting journey and um, all the advice that you guys have shared today. This has been really great chatting. Thanks for having us. Yeah. <laughs> There you have it, my conversation with Alex and Clara from Sunday Betting. Here's a couple key takeaways that I got from this conversation. One, sometimes a job is just what you make out of it. 
Alex really didn't have a choice when it came to his career, and he knew he had to work for his family business. And while it wasn't the sexiest of jobs, he was able to leverage the platform and incorporate his passion and interest and build Sunday betting on top of it. Two, don't hide behind your computer screen. This was something that Dinesh Rabchop spoke a lot about in episode eight as well. When Alex and Clara first started out, they did a lot of pop-up stores to get their brand out there. This really helps people get to know the quality of their product, especially in Asia, where people really still very much appreciate seeing an item in person. Doing a lot of pop-up stores also really helps them to build relationships with their customers, and really helps their brand grow via word of mouth. And lastly, having a physical store also really helps them in terms of creating a very differentiated marketing strategy, especially in this day and age when. Everyone is throwing money on Facebook and Instagram to try to get new customers. Three. How did Clara decide to leave her corporate job to join Sunday Betting full time? She did that by setting milestones for the business. She would only quit her job when Sunday Betting hit certain revenue targets. I really like this very methodical and rational way of approaching it, as it really takes the emotion and stress out of the decision. And this is actually something that Joyce from episode two did when she was deciding whether or not to quit her architecture job to become a full-time artist. She actually spoke quite at length about this and her process around this. So definitely go check out episode two if you are interested. Four, don't take things too personally. You're definitely going to receive negative feedback and unhappy customers when you're starting a business. You just need to learn to grow with thick skin and accept that you can't please everyone. Five, and lastly, when you run a business, your life really becomes your business. It's super important you protect your mental well-being and try to find ways to separate out your life from your business. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Control Alt Career. Check back in two weeks from now for our next episode, where I'll be interviewing the founder of Guru and hear how Scott is building the Netflix for education. And if you like this episode, I would love it if you shared with two friends and tag me on social media so I know that you're listening to it. Thanks so much for tuning in, as always, guys. I'll see you guys back here in two weeks. 